All right, welcome Physics 30s. This is Mr. Jukli here. Another day, another Physics 30 lesson. This one is all about Snell's Law and total internal reflection. It's an extension off that refraction that we looked at last time. It's actually now the mathematical explanation uh, for that, uh, for the refraction that we talked about in the last one. So if you're not already there, open your books up to Unit 4, Lesson 5, and we will jump right in. So, uh, Willard Broad Snell uh, was the person to actually develop the formula to predict the properties of that refracted ray. So, what exactly is going on? You might remember, you know, we've got an incident ray, so theta i, uh, and it's going from one medium to another. In this case, this must be a fast medium to a slow medium, uh, or a uh, lower optical density to a higher optical density is another way to put that as well and I know that because the refracted ray capital R for refracted uh, is actually at a smaller angle so it's closer to the normal line and when you go from a fast to a slow medium you bend towards the normal line anyways bit of review from last time the mathematical explanation started off with sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 is equal to n2 over n1. So when we go through and when we look at this, typically we go through and we say, okay, well, this is my incident and this is my refracted angle. Uh, we might need to start going through and talking about this, our incident, if we've got n1 and we're saying that the optical density of, uh, in this case, it looks like it's air, um, would be equal to 1.00. Remember, that's not actually given to us. Um, we would say that N2 is inside of whatever this prism is, whether it's glass or plastic or whatever, and everything about it is 2. So everything about air, so the incident angle, we'd call 1, we'd call optical density 1, uh, and then everything in 2, we would call, or everything about the prism, we would call too. Um, we'll look at that. It might make a little bit more sense when we get into an example here. But anyways, we start off with this. Through time, it is expanded to include pretty much everything that changes as we go from one medium into the other. And again, if I'm calling air medium one, everything about air is medium one. So the angle, the speed, the wavelength, you name it, Everything about air is N1. And then whatever this green prism is, let's say it's glass for the time being, everything about inside of the glass is we're going to call two. Uh, one really important thing that can be a huge time saver, actually, is to recognize what never changes once it leaves the source vibration. So when we're talking about true waves, the frequency never, ever changes once it leaves the source vibration. We're going to see how helpful that's going to be in a moment here. Cool. So we got our new formula. Let's go through. Let's check it out in action. So I've got 630 nanometer light, cool, that enters into glass. So it's starting out here in air at 630 nanometers. It enters into glass as shown. It says the index of refraction for the glass is 1.54. We want to determine the angle of refraction and the frequency when it's in the glass. Cool. So let's start to uh, set this up a little bit more nicely here. Set this up just a little bit more nicely. So I have my incident angle. Actually, I don't have my incident angle. I have 18 degrees. Is that my incident angle? Not particularly. So theta i, and actually I'm probably even just going to call this theta 1. Uh, remember, has to be compared to the normal line. And honestly, let's go through and let's start to label this everything about air we're going to call 1. So air is 1. Everything about air is equal to 1. So if I've got 18 degrees compared to the glass, my incident angle, or theta 1, would have to be 72 degrees compared to the normal. OK, cool. That's not bad. And then in the glass, let's call everything about the glass 2 so it fits with our formula fairly well. Cool. So glass is all about 2. Uh, I know if I'm going from a faster to a slower medium, this should be bending towards my normal line. And there's my theta 2 right there. And that, I think, is the goal of the question, is we're trying to figure out the angle of refraction, which realistically, the way that we're labeling it, is theta 2, or at least for part A. Cool. 
let's go through and figure out because it doesn't look like we have enough information quite yet right we're, we're getting there but we're not quite yet so in air we've got theta 1 is 72 degrees we've got that and it looks like that's everything but we actually have a couple other pieces of information we've also got the speed of light in air so I wrote C1 I should maybe uh, just redo that and say V1 which is equal to C, which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second, right? So it's the speed of light through air. We've got that. We've also got the optical density or the index of refraction for 1 as well. And we know that if it's through air, it's just 1.00. Nice and easy, right? So we actually have more information than we, than we need. Okay, let's check out the next little bit. So in glass, what do we have in the glass? So I've got theta 2 is the goal and I've got the optical density of the glass it was in the question there 1.54 and now that's all the information that we really have is that enough information to go ahead and solve for that angle yeah absolutely okay let's check it out let's check it out I'm just gonna move everything down a little bit can still see so I'm gonna use and we've got this whole big formula sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 is equal to n2 over n1 is equal to v1 over v2 is equal to what am i forgetting wavelength uh wavelength one over wavelength two now as i go through and as i look at this um really we're only using the angles and the optical densities i don't really need any of these speeds or wavelengths yet so i'm just going to erase that part of the formula and only use the part of the formula that we're actually dealing with. Cool, so I'm looking for sine theta 2, so I guess I should probably rearrange and solve for uh, sine theta 2. Actually, I'm looking for theta 2, but we'll get there. So sine theta 2. You might want to put the video on pause and do some rearranging, or you can do it with me here. So that's going to be equal to sine theta 1 times n1 divided by n2 and let's just do a quick double check there to make sure that that is all good so sine theta 2 yeah i think because i brought those ones up okay looking pretty good uh now here's the thing i don't really want sine theta 2 so i could go through and i could solve at this point um or i could go through and i could just rearrange and solve for theta 2 which i think i'll actually kind of do here so uh this might be a little bit messy this is not my best work i've ever done here let's go theta 2 which is our refracted angle is equal to the inverse sine of everything we had in brackets so that's sine theta 1 times n1 divided by n2 and then there we've got that angle we can go ahead plug some numbers in and go through so that's inverse sine times 72 degrees I'm forgetting something very important there times the sine of 72 degrees times n1 which is just one so that's easy and then divided by n2 which I forgot to write a little two up there in the top uh, left hand side of the screen uh, which was let's see 1.54 Cool, okay, so this is a doozy to put in our calculator. I'll show you a couple different ways that you could actually look at this as soon as the old calculator turns on there. So, uh, first thing I'd want to do is probably make sure that I am still in degree mode. Looks like I am, perfect. So I'm going to do inverse sine, so second function, sine. And then this is where it gets a little bit weird to plug in. I'm going to do the sine of 72 degrees. I have to close that bracket times 1. Guess I really didn't need to include that. And then divided by 1.54, close the bracket yet again, and we plug the numbers in, and it should work out to be 38.13883 blah 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 degrees. Uh, one thing that we'll probably want to include with this is some significant digits. I'm going to go back up to the original original question here. Okay, three three looks like three everywhere. So that would be uh, shoot, I forgot already. Where to go? 38.1 degrees. So theta 2, which is theta restart. It's a little messy there. 
theta 2, which is our refracted angle, theta r, is 38.1 degrees. Now, if that was a little bit weird to put in your calculator, the sine inside of the sine, which is kind of weird, um, you could also go through and you could just do, okay, well, sine theta 1, uh, where did that go? Sine of 72, close bracket, times 1, divided by 1.54. Get your answer there in decimal form. Do second function, inverse sine of that answer, and that would work just as well. All right, so if you're a little on edge about, you know, inverse sine of the sine of something else, then just do it this way. Do it in steps. No problems there. Cool. So that is, uh, that's part A. That's part A. Uh, oh, here we go. A little bit nicer, a little bit neater on that one. But uh, yeah, part A, 38.1 degrees. Okay, part B, I apparently didn't leave myself enough space for. So let's go back to this screen. And you know what I might do? I might just erase the bottom part. You can always rewind and have a look at that. Erase all that hard work I did on the bottom. Get rid of every little piece. But we are going to add something to. So we're going back to this idea that this is my summary of my information. I'm just going to add, and maybe I'll even do it in a different color just to uh, make it stand out a little bit. Uh, we now have theta 2 as 38.1 degrees. So that's something that we found in the first place. Cool. So let's have a look at part B. Just to be very clear, we are on part B. It is asking us for the frequency inside of the glass. So in the glass. Hmm, that's interesting, right? Because there's an easy way to do this, and then there's a, a harder way to do this, or a long and a short way to do this. I'm going to show you the short way to do this. Um, there's something important that we need to recognize if we're doing the short way. What never changes... What property of a wave never changes once it leaves the source? If you say the frequency, ah, you are good to go. You are good to go. So frequency does not change once it leaves the source. So let's work with that. B, frequency, frequency, there we go, doesn't change. Or in other words, the frequency in the air, so in medium 1, is going to be equal to the frequency in the glass, which is medium 2. So if I can find it in the air, I can also find it in the glass. So let's go through. Let's think about all the things that we could possibly have here to help us figure out uh, the frequency. And let's think about, like, what's the only one formula that we really have with frequency? It's not really in Snell's law. I think the only place where we really see it is V is equal to frequency times wavelength, right? So it's a universal wave equation. So as I check out that universal wave equation, let's see, I need the frequency and I need the wavelength in order to figure out, or sorry, uh, the speed and the wavelength in order to figure out my frequency. So do I have that for the air? Looking up here. So I have the speed, I have Let's see. Oh, yeah, look at that. From the original question, we're going to say lambda 1 is 630 nanometers. So we actually have that as well. It wasn't really important for part A, but, uh, but absolutely we've got that. Okay, cool. So I think we have everything to do that. Let's just go through and make sure that we're very clear. So this is speed in the air, so I'm going to call it speed 1, and wavelength in the air, so I'm going to call that wavelength 1. So as I go through, I say, okay, well, frequency is going to be equal to, as I rearrange this, the speed divided by the wavelength, both in the air. So I'm putting 1 for air again. So the speed was just 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. The wavelength, I think it was 630, but I better double check. Yes, 630 nanometers, but hold the phone. We don't really want nanometers. So we're going to do times 10 to the negative 9 meters. And then we can go through and we can plug that in. And let's see our frequency when all is said and done. I think should be 4.76 times 10 to the power of 14 hertz. Right? And now we did just calculate the frequency in the 
air, but it doesn't change. So we also figured out the frequency nice in the glass. Perfect. Question solved. Want to look at the hard way? I don't know if it's harder, but the longer way. So let's think about if we got tripped up here. So if we got tripped up and we were really focusing on the glass, what would we need to do in order to figure that out for the glass? Well, we need to figure out the speed in the glass. So we need to use a Snell's law equation to figure out the speed. We would need to figure out the wavelength in the glass. So we need to use Snell's law two additional times and then use our uh, and then use our universal wave equation with the v2 and lambda2 to figure out, well, the exact same thing. Here, let's check it out. We got it all typed out here for us. So here is the short version. Nope, that's the answer from before. Here's the short version. So knowing that the frequency doesn't change, we just use everything in glass. Here's the longer version. Okay, so first off, we need to figure out wavelength two, then I could go through, I could either use Snell's law, I forgot we could use this one to be honest with our n is equal to c over v. We could use that to figure out our speed in the glass, so v2, and then finally we use the universal wave equation to look at that, get to the exact same thing. Cool. So, like I said, understanding that frequency doesn't change is kind of an important thing. Saves a bunch of time. Okay, next thing that I want to check out with you is our universal wave equation. Or sorry, yeah, I'm losing my mind here. Um, our idea of total internal reflection. I got to put it on pause because I got to figure out where that uh, that bending light application is. Nice, found it. Okay, so we've seen this before. I turn the laser pointer on. We see it going, in this case, from a fast medium up top to a slower medium down below or a higher index of refraction on the bottom. Cool. And in this case, what do we have here? You can see on the right-hand side of the screen, we've got air, which has an optical density or index of refraction of 1, uh, or water, which has an index of refraction of 1.33. And we know that it's going to bend towards the line. So we're dealing with total internal reflection. Let's think about that for a second. Total internal reflection. So we can see with this that there is this little line that's being reflected and stays in the air. I wouldn't call that total though because most of the ray is passing into the water, but there is some reflection happening here. Let's see if I can move the laser pointer and get it to totally reflect inside of or internal within the, uh, within the air. So I move this this way, it refracts, I still have the reflected ray but not there's always, always, always some until I get to here and then it's just a straight line. It's not actually going from one medium to another. There's always some that is being refracted into the water. Okay, so that's not going to work whatsoever here. We cannot have total internal reflection if we're going from a fast medium to a slow medium. Let's switch this a little bit. So I'm going to put the top as water and I'm going to put the bottom as glass. Oh, look at that. Okay. So now in this case, we remember that, okay, we, we've definitely got some of this going on where we've got the, the bending. Oh, I screwed that up a little bit, didn't I? I want water, not glass. I want air. There we go. So yes, that's a little bit easier to deal with. So now I've, got, I've still got refraction. I've got that reflected ray coming back up. I wonder if there's a place where I could make it where that refle ref <laughs> reflected ray uh, is the only thing that I've really got. So let's see, if I move this way, then my refracted, that's the one on the bottom, is closer to the normal line. But now it keeps moving. The bottom ray, the refracted ray, keeps moving further and further and further and further and further. And then right, somewhere right in here, it looks like that refracted ray just follows right along. I wish I could draw on this. I don't think I can. No, I definitely can't. Uh, it looks like that refracted ray just follows right along the... Uh, right along the surface interface and if I go any more than that all of a sudden it's just reflected on the inside and that's all we get this is total internal reflection all of it is reflected on the inside and it's just past this one little where is it there we go one little breaking point somewhere right in here again where the refracted ray is pretty much at 90 degrees if we're any bigger than that well then all of it just stays inside and we have total internal reflection very very cool okay so let's check this out and let's let's figure this out. 
So summary of everything that we just talked about. That angle, that sort of breaking point that we saw actually has a name. Let's go back to my nicer felt pen. Actually has a name. It's called the critical angle. So the critical angle is the instant angle when the refracted angle is 90 degrees. So critical angle is our incident angle when refracted equals 90 degrees, which is kind of shown in the diagram, which I made messier, but whatever. Cool. This has to be, the only way that we can have this is if we're going from a slow to a fast medium, because in a slow to fast medium, the refracted ray bends, how can I word this really succinctly? Uh, refracted ray bends away from the normal line. It doesn't do that in uh, when it goes from fast to slow. It bends towards the normal line, which is further and further and further from total internal reflection. So got to be from slow to fast. Cool. So this is sort of the big idea that we look at with this. It's, it's our critical angle. It, that is our incident angle when the refracted ray is 90 degrees. And then like we saw, if our incident angle is at all bigger than our critical angle, we're going to have total internal reflection. There's going to be no refraction whatsoever. Every little bit of it's going to stay inside of that first medium. Okay, let's check out a quick example of this and, and put all those things together that we were just talking about here. Still, by the way, using the ideas of Snell's law and that big formula that Snell put out there for us. Okay, so we've got the critical angle for an air diamond interface is 24.3 degrees. Cool. How much time would it take, so that's our question, how much time uh, for light to travel through 5.7 centimeters, 5.71 centimeters of the diamond, and we want to include a ray diagram. Now one thing that's a little bit tricky with this question is it doesn't tell us whether or not the ray is going from air to diamond or from diamond to air, we should just know that it has to be from a slow medium to a fast medium. So that means that it has to be from diamond, uh, diamond, and it's going into air. So I'm going to draw my normal line right there. I'm going to draw my ray coming actually you know what a different color might be a little bit nice for this so let's undo that I'm going to draw my ray let's use blue coming in a skinnier blue though coming in here and then it's going to refract and go just right along the surface with an angle of 90 degrees perfect so it's starting in the air and then it's attempting to uh, leave, sorry, starting in the diamond and then attempting to leave. So here's what we'll do. We'll label this and we'll just say everything about diamond, spelled diamond wrong there. Okay, slightly better. You know what I'm talking about though. Everything about diamond is going to be equal to one. So here's what we've got for diamond. We've got our incident angle is happening inside of the diamond. So that's theta 1, and that's equal to 24.3 degrees. Let's see. I don't think we know much else about the diamond, to be honest. I definitely don't think we do. Uh, let's go through and let's look at the air side of things then. So air. We know a handful of things about air. Let's call it air 2. So we know that, uh, let's see, the optical density of air, well, that's easy. It's just 1. We know that the speed through air, so uh, V2, is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. And this one's not given to us, but we actually know theta 2, theta 2, or the refracted angle, is 90 degrees when we're at our critical angle. So now I think we've got all the information, just sort of summarized what we're looking at here. Okay. The question is, how much time would it take to travel through 5 centimeters of diamond, 5.7 centimeters of diamond? So it travels with uniform motion, which is V is equal to D over T. We've got the D, so 5.71 is a distance that's traveling. We're looking for the time. I think if we had the speed, we'd be good to go. So maybe we'll add that to our list over here. V1 
is our question mark, our initial question mark that we've got. Cool. So looking for V1, not so bad, not so bad. I think we have enough information. Let's get Snell's law out here. I'm going to write the whole thing again. Let's see if I can do this. So I've got all the info on the screen at once. So I'm going to go with, uh, let's see, sine theta 1 or sine theta 2 is equal to n2 over n1 is equal to v2. Nope. That's something if you're confused about that, make sure you check your data sheet. Most of these are 1s over 2s, but not all of them. Oh, somehow it went back to red. Okay, I don't know how exactly that happened, but got the same color back. Uh, so where was I? V1 over V2, which is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, what's the one I'm missing? Lambda. Lambda 1 over Lambda 2. Cool. So we want to pick and choose the parts that we're actually going to use for this. Let's see. Don't really need the optical density, so I'll get rid of that part. And don't really need the wavelength, so I'll get rid of that part. There we go. I've got sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 is equal to V1 over V2. No problem. Maybe I'll just rewrite that real quick just to make sure that we are using our space wisely. Perfect. Now I'm looking for V2. We just got to rearrange. Uh, V2 is going to be equal to sine theta 2 over V1 divided by sine theta 1. Let me just do a quick double check. So those two up, that one down. Perfect. Let's plug some numbers in. So let's see. The sine theta 2, we said error was 2, so that's the sine of 90 degrees times V1. Ugh. Okay. Hold the phone here. What are we solving for? This is why it's important to stay straight and, and keep things straight here. Uh, we're solving for V1. Dang it. Okay, I'm going to put it on pause. You do the same. You erase if you're following. We'll fix this. Alrighty, so I fixed it up a little bit there. Actually solving for V1 now. Uh, plugging the numbers in the correct place. So we end up with V1, that's the speed through the diamond, as 1.2345. I love that number. 1.2345 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. You'll notice that I'm not really rounding this because we're going to use that in a split second here. So plug the numbers in, make sure you get to the same place, put it on pause if you need to. Finally, it's asking for how much time it takes to go through 5.71 centimeters. So we know it's traveling with uniform motion. So we use basic V is equal to D over T. So T must be equal to D over V. We make sure the units are in a good spot there. So 0.0, .0 five seven one meters divided by one point two three four five times ten to the power of eight meters per second and as expected this will be a very very small amount of time when we plug things in four point six three times ten to the uh let's see negative ten seconds okay cool we can do some little things just to double check here make sure so even if i didn't catch my screw up figuring out the speed, the speed through diamond, which is V1, should be slower than the speed of light through air, 3 times 10 to the power of 8. Cool. So if I didn't catch that screw up, I might have ended up something faster. Ew, that's, that's not going to work out so well for us. We ended up with something slower, and then we ended up with a very, very, very small amount of time. Cool. Let's try and rush through the last little tiny bit here and, uh, and get you doing some practice. So that's some space for me to work. So applications of total internal reflection. This is some pretty neat stuff. So a couple different prisms. You might be thinking to yourself, oh, where do we see prisms? One of the places is in big old binoculars. So not the little tiny ones, but the big old binoculars. Because, uh, you know, your eyes, here's some eyes. You can tell their eyes because of the eyelashes uh, are pretty close together. But these huge binoculars are gathering light from things that are sometimes very far apart, right? It's a wider than your eye can go. So we need those prisms. So it goes up, goes through total internal reflection once, twice, three times, four times, and then narrows those rays so that they fit into your eyes. 
pretty cool. Pretty good stuff. Diamonds. Oh, I put the other thing in the wrong place. Shoot, we'll come back to those uh, prisms. Uh, diamonds are another place. So diamonds are super sparkly. Super sparkly if they're cut properly. So here's the deal with this. If they are cut properly, they have a very, very, very high index of refraction, which means that they have a low, um, they have a low or small uh, critical angle. So if they're cut properly with that critical angle, what we see is all of the light rays that are coming in typically get trapped. They go through total internal reflection, and then they come straight back out the top. Um, which is why when you look down at a diamond, they look oh so sparkly and so pretty. Uh, if they're not cut very well, then yeah, we can have some total internal reflection, but not on the other side, so the light can pass through. Or maybe we don't even have total internal reflection. If they're cut too shallow, then we'll have that refracted ray, and the light will just pass. Most of the light will just pass right out of it. So it's not just that they're sparkly; it's that they're sparkly. And some people have figured out how to cut them so that they're very sparkly. Cool. Optical fiber is another one. So lots of people are getting uh, the fiber optic uh, internet in their houses. It essentially works off this. One quick question for you is how would you compare the density, that's the optical density of the core compared to the cladding? So which one has to have a higher optical density? The core or the cladding? If you're saying that the core has to have, uh, let's see, it's both C's. So N for core has to be greater than N for cladding. That's the only way that it can really work, right? Because it has to be going from a slow medium to a fast medium. Um, perfect. And then what condition? Well, our incident angle has to be greater than our critical angle. Right? So a couple things need to go on with that, but you can do some pretty cool stuff with communications with this. Um, this is just a picture of a bee looking through one of them. But uh, one of the things you can look at is these optical fibers. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call this communication, but uh, through bronchoscopes, essentially what we have is we have, um, in its most basic sense, is we have two fiber optic cables, one that carries light through total internal reflection down. Uh, you look at the bronchial surface, so inside of somebody's nose, inside of somebody's lungs, and then it reflects off of the surface uh, and goes through total internal reflection down another tube into this person's eyes, where he can see what the heck's going on inside of your throat and lungs and stuff like that. Uh, for communications, like I say, uh, lots of speakers have uh, fancy speakers, have optical cables, so optical in. Um, TELUS, I think, is the one that's doing uh, high-speed internet. Rainbows is another great example of this. Like, There's all kinds of crazy examples. So essentially what happens with rainbows is we have sunlight coming into little water droplets in the sky. It is refracting, and we're going to learn soon enough that purple reflects, refracts sorry, more than red. So it starts to split apart or disperse. And then as it splits parts and disperse, it hits the other side. And if it's at a good angle for this, it will actually go through total internal reflection. And you'll see the rainbow on the other side, which is kind of cool. So uh, yeah, this is essentially what you're looking at for that. So the sunlight would typically have to be behind the person. The rainbow from their vantage point is over here in front of this person. And so it refracts on its way in and then goes through total internal reflection and refracts again on its way out, splitting up the light into its components. Uh, 40 to 42 degrees is typically what you're looking at for uh, for rainbows. So you notice that they're usually not too high in the sky. Uh, they're usually when the sun is fairly low, so sunshine. I'm really good at drawing suns, apparently. Uh, fairly low, and where there's water droplets sort of on the opposite side of the sky. Cool. This is another one. This is actually me. You can see up my nose here. Uh, these are called lazy readers. Uh, so essentially the idea is you can lay down and you can use the idea of total internal reflection to see your book and not have to lift your head up. Uh, this is actually a picture of me taking a picture of my phone. I'm looking straight forward in the classroom. Uh, at least my head is pointed straight forward in the classroom, but I'm looking down at my phone. So the ray diagram that you see with this is you've got the object. You might have your book over here, I'm pretty sure I'm translating that to English. I have no idea, actually. But uh, and you've got the rays, so it goes in, goes through, uh, reflects off a mirror, goes through total internal reflection, and then comes down to your eye so that you can 
read your book. Again, more of a prism for that one. Okay, last little piece to talk about is, do you remember the order of the atomic spectrum? Um, or sorry, of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum? Radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma. Today we're talking about microwaves. So microwaves were originally used and designed for detecting planes in World War II. Right? They, they penetrate better than radio can, so they can get really high up there to, the, uh, to like spy planes and stuff like that. Uh, one of the people who was working on this technology, um, I was reading up on them a little bit here, uh, working on this technology in the war for uh, detecting planes, uh, kept having, he loved feeding squirrels apparently in, uh, on his lunch break, so he, he kept having these peanut cluster bars in his pocket, uh, and dealing with the microwaves, he, he saw that the peanut cluster bars kept melting inside of his pocket. Um, not chocolate bars, there's lots of misinformation about chocolate bars, apparently they melt, they, like they just melt inside of your pocket at room temperature. Peanut cluster bars need a much higher temperature to do it. Uh, but anyways, so it heats it up enough in order to melt it. So, hence, well, we still use them for communication, still use them for like radar and spotting spy planes and stuff. But, and now, I mean, cell phones, satellite dishes, all kinds of things use them, but also now, uh, microwave ovens use them. Uh, fun fact, I looked this up, the first microwave oven after that peanut cluster bar uh, weighed about 750 pounds and weighed, or sorry, cost about $2,000. It didn't say whether that was American or not. It doesn't really matter. In 1947 money, that's a ridiculous amount of money. 750 pounds in $2,000. Pretty crazy. So anyways, the way the micro microwaves work uh, is that they essentially have a magnetron. Magnetron causes electrons to spin around uh, in circular motion at a rate of 2.5 gigahertz. That's 2.5 uh, giga, I think that is million or billion. I'd have to look that one up. I'm losing it right now. Um, but 2.5 gigahertz, that's 2.5 gigacycles every single single every single every second, uh, which then produces EMR, because remember, what's the source of EMR? As far as we know right now, it is accelerating charges, so produces EMR with a frequency of 2.5 gigahertz. You'll never guess what the natural resonating frequency of water molecules are. If you guessed 2.5 gigahertz, you are spot on. So this radiation, uh, its frequency matches the natural vibrating frequency of water perfectly. So when, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when uh, the radiation interacts with the molecules, it absorbs the energy and it causes them to, uh, to vibrate faster and faster and faster and faster. And that faster and faster that the individual water molecules are moving uh, corresponds to the temperature change or the kinetic energy or the heat energy, if you will, of your food molecules, uh, which is pretty cool. Anyways, I think we're gonna leave it there. Sorry, this one took a little bit longer. I'm not entirely sure why I plan on it being shorter, but uh, anyways, that's it for this one. Have a good one, Physics 20s, or 30s. Wow, I'm really losing it. Have a good one, Physics 30s. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.